Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Dangerous Rhetoric. This is episode 110. Um, and before we get into it today, I want to remind you to like, comment, subscribe, share the show with your friends, do all the things. You can give us money if you want. There are links in the description. We really appreciate that. Um, and with that all said, thank you to Amy Souza for joining us today. Amy is a women's rights organizer and embodiment expert, and we'll get into what all of that means and what Amy does. Uh, thank you so much, Amy, for making the time and taking the time out and joining us. We appreciate the chat. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's just a pleasure to be here. And yeah, I, I appreciate your work as well. I was doing like a little background because I remember we had that conversation on Twitter um, a while ago about feminism. And mm -hmm. that was kind of like we were that was when we decided like we should chat. But I realized I was like searching for our interactions on Twitter and like we go back. Like, I've been following you since like 20, 2022. Oh, cool. Um, and you had like a, an organiz uh, there was an organized you event. Make it sound like that was so long so ago. Long <laughs> ago. So, oh. last year, right? <laughs> so long ago. Um, it feels like it, feels like yeah. it was long ago. Well, a lot happens in a week sometimes. But like there was a, an organized protest you guys had in Philadelphia that I thought was really interesting, too, with um, with Gabby, who I, I've seen here in New York. She gets around. She's like a real big activist type. Um, do you just want, why don't you just give us your background a little yeah, bit? You know, how did you... Let's start with the background background. The backstory, yeah, backstory. Like, where are you from? Where did you grow up? Where did you go to school? <laughs> We'll start with the basics. Just briefly, though, you don't have to get super into it. My grandfather immigrated to this country. <laughs> now. The whole family tree. <laughs> Um, so my, my two kind of main backgrounds are, uh, psychology and theater. Uh, I was a theater educator for many years in the New York city public schools doing, uh, conflict resolution, anger management, self-esteem building with kids. Um, I went on, uh, and got my, my master's in psychology, <clears throat> have been a uh, education director at, at a small theater in Washington State and now have uh, taken all of those things and I do embodiment work, which is uh, really about uh, understanding our, our uh, that we are fully occupied uh, and that our bodies are a source of instincts and awareness and the tools of embodiment are a primary safeguarding uh, skill set for us. But um, I came to this particular issue when I was teaching theater uh, here in Port Townsend, Washington, and I was um, I was raised fundamentalist Christian, so I always had this critique of um, what I called then gender. I, I don't like to use that word anymore. I say sex-based stereotypes. Right. Um, but because, uh, the, the church that I was raised in was pretty fundamentalist with like, you know, men are the head of the household and, and women are meant to submit to their will. I, I had a lot of critiques of those, of those roles. And I, I never wanted those roles to be projected onto my body. And that was really how I taught the kids. I, um, I, I did a lot of play building with them. So I helped them, uh, do, uh, create their own plays from writing, uh, all the way to production. I wanted them to express themselves, their own values in their own voices, um, and, and be able to really take a lot of ownership of what they were doing. Uh, and I was always saying things to them, like, you know, this is your opportunity, uh, to explore. And I, I wanted them to pay attention to the cultural dictates that were coming on them that might be um, uh, narrow or feel confining. Uh, and theater, obviously, is a really exploratory place. So, you know, I would say things like, you know, makeup is just face paint. It's just, it's, it's neutral. It's, it's a, it's a neutral pigment product. Uh, clothing is, is just fabric. Fabric is, is neutral. These, these are, these are neutral items that culture imbues with meaning and significance. So, you know, this is a place where you can explore playing with those things, whether, uh, you know, whether you want to be, a, <laughs> an alien or a, a, a mythic, um, you know, griffin type character or you know whether you want to you know be a girl who is you know writing a boy character or something like this uh so i was always you know helping to give them tools to um address the things that they felt were confining in the culture uh however there was um a young man in the community who the uh the rest of the community started pushing down this uh 
trans path uh, and help we're helping to crowdfund to get him hormones now again my background was already in embodiment and to me this was different this was new this was different uh and i didn't appreciate where this was going because my my whole purview was that um you know your body is not an identity your body your body is you know you can explore anything you want to in your body and this notion that his body was wrong uh -huh. that, that there was something wrong with him that he had to um take drugs to change uh and that he was gonna get a surgery to you know literally cut off his healthy body part like to not love and 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 embrace your body it it was really um sad i was so sad about it and i was really upset i i was just like conflicted and and upset and i started uh, this was like the beginning of me pushing back to uh, community members uh, and the amount of even this was back in um, this was maybe starting in like 2009 ish uh, and I, I was already getting uh, pushback on this. Uh, the thing that launched me 2009 is early. That's pretty early. Like you were, you were already pushing back way before most of us even in realized. Theater, it's, this was, she's, she's on the edge there. there. Yeah, I was just verbally saying little things. I wasn't an I wasn't an activist yet. You the thing that, firm. that, that <laughs> you weren't affirming, and that is what matters here. You know, everyone expects that you're just supposed to automatically affirm these things instead of asking a question and saying, "Well, are you sure?" that this is the correct thing to do. Cause you know, the, the way they preach this whole ideology is like, oh, it's all about loving and accepting who you are. But when you really analyze what it is, it's is that it's the opposite. You know, you're not loving and accepting who you are. You want to fundamentally change who you are, which you can't do at a sex level. It's not possible. No, you can't, you, you, can, you can mimic, you can create a facsimile, but you can't, you can never change who you are you know this this young man he's never going to be a woman he's he's going to be a young man who is uh attempting to present with female secondary sex characteristics but he's he hasn't come any closer to being a woman it's you know the, these developmental paths they're they're parallel you can't you, you can't get any closer we don't have the nanotechnology yet to go in yeah. and replace every single set of Not dna it just doesn't we, don't, we can't do it doesn't exist can't do it yeah. um so uh just briefly uh me me too was happening like 2015 that was pretty pivotal for me um i had a I won't go into it, but I, I had a rape story that I told at that time and felt really empowered by it. Um, and then the Women's March happened. And the thing that really activated me is I was on the Women's March page and these men, these group of men were saying that, you know, pussy hats were transphobic. Uh, and I was like, pussy hats can't be transphobic. What are vaginas transphobic? And they were like, yeah, vaginas are transphobic. And I was like, <laughs> delusional thoughts from fantasy island yeah. i was like sure surely not surely not um and i was just you know pushing back pushing back because i thought it was so ridiculous uh these group of men doxed me wow they found my my home info my uh previous addresses um i was living in uh, washington by then but they had like all these previous new york addresses and um old uh, work contacts and my dad's business number and uh <laughs> they were hardcore um but it really i just thought this was something that i was still uh, just sort of speaking out against privately and that gave me th th weirdly they activated me into understanding how urgent it was to speak out about this publicly yeah that's some interesting there, there's this um there's this thing in physics and electric and electricity specifically called contact potential difference and this is when you have a sufficient enough difference between the positive charge and the negative charge pole that a spark can jump and you have to have a sufficient uh, amount of electrical difference 
for that phenomenon to manifest. To balance out. Well, right. what we see often in society or in social movements is that you have something like this trans rights movement, which inspires its natural antagonist, which is kind of like what's been happening. So it's funny to see that that phenomenon in, in social movements as well as in the on the ba most basic level of uh, like physics and electricity. I really like that metaphor. Say that again. What is Contact it called? Contact potential difference. Contact potential difference. I'm going to write that down. Like, yeah, no down. problem. Write that down. Yeah, actually, I got that from uh, a, a board I used to be on. It was a philosophy board where we used to talk about a lot of this stuff and they, that was where that term came from. But they, they used a lot of metaphors there. And this was- I like it. That's a great, a great metaphor. metaphor. It's really good. I mean, it, and, and it, we see it. We see it manifesting more and more. The harder they push for you know the mutilation and sterilization of minors, the more parents are waking up, the more activists yeah. are getting out there. I mean, just like a year ago, you know, Billboard Chris had like, I think less than 100,000 followers. And he's got five times that many now. And, you know, he's been on Tucker and then the, the more they attack him and then the more they assault him, he was just assaulted, you know, two weeks ago on Trans Day of Visibility. Yeah. Um, you know, the more they do that, the more they sort of reveal themselves yep. as these crazy, delusional, out of touch, aggressive uh, activists. It also reveals how effective he is. And, and this kind of brings up another thing, too, where there's a bit, there's a divide a bit in, in the movement that's pushing back against this stuff. There are the rad femmes, and a lot of the rad femmes don't like Billboard Chris. Um, some of them have said they don't like that he's becoming, they call him like the face of the movement. They're like, the face of the movement should be a woman. And and this is kind of something I want to address here. And it's, although the transgender ideology issue has a more, we'll, we'll, we'll call it a disproportionate effect on women, just because there's a dis, there's a, a disparity of force between men and women. So men can take things further and harm women when they're in women's spaces. It is also erasing men. It is erasing biology in general. And this is also why a lot of uh, people who are homosexual or bisexual are becoming active in the movement as well, because it's not just erasing women's rights, it's erasing same-sex attraction rights as well because you're literally erasing reality. Like you can't have any of that stuff if, if you just, you're no longer gonna have a distinction between, between the two. So this really is, this is a human issue. This is not simply a feminist issue. And, and it's, I think so, it's important for people to understand it's that. It's so fundamental too. Yes. When you get down to basics of reality 101, yes. you know, yeah. something about all mammalian life is yeah. that we're sexually dimorphic. There are yeah. males and there yeah. are females. And it's that's as an basic as night and day, right. light and dark, you know? It's just it's like very, very basic. Yeah. And they're trying to get in there and just erase that category entirely uh, or say that, you know, it's some sort of social contrivance yeah. when, again, it's like, you you know, it, being in a, in a male body, you know, I know what it's like to yep. be a man yeah. and I'll never know what it's like to be a woman. Yeah. And uh, a woman will never know what it's like to be a man. You can't, you can't just remove your breasts, take testosterone, or if you want to go even further, you know, have skin flayed from your arm or your leg and have a flesh tube sewn onto your body. That's not a penis. You know, you're, you don't have testicles. Oh my you're, God. You're never. Those are just such Frankenstein surgeries. The pictures are crazy. And I like to post oh. them sometimes, even though I know they're uncomfortable to look at. I think people need to see that stuff. They yeah. need to understand that that is the potential end to this road that we're sending people down it's mostly important. young yeah. people on yes. the autistic spectrum yes. that have had trauma trauma it's like the stuff. most vulnerable among us yes. who we should be protecting who we should look out for who we should be like yeah hey these people they need to be protected from predatory ideologies from predatory you know yep. medicalization uh from pharma seeking profit uh and and this is what happens to them and it's just so tragic yeah and yeah. it's also like it's crazy too the how you know and this is something too we have to address as well like despite the fact that women are coming to more harm from this ideology it is actually primarily being pushed by women a lot of it is something that's being advocated for by women and a lot of that has to do with women sort of nurturing their their natural nature to to nurture to be to be nice they want to be inclusive they want people to feel to feel good and by doing that they they don't really push back or they say we have to be nice and accept these people for who they are and yeah. doing that has opened the door to all of this and now biology itself is being thrown out the window yeah i think it's i think it's really um 
you know, what you're saying is it, there's some truth, but I think also just it's important to have a, a global sort of accuracy mm -hmm. on on what's happening. And I do agree that I women fall under what is called the the empathy trap. You know, we we um, the and this is um, I think that in a sort of like if you think of this as like engineer level and then like proselytizer level <laughs> i do think a lot of women are on that um you know being the apostles or the prophets of the yeah. ideology um, but women are certainly not the engineers of oh it. no i mean john money the these yeah. this stuff was come up men came up with this shit. old that's, pedophiles that's definitely yeah, exactly. true you got a point there that's definitely correct yeah exactly but i think you know i think what it it play it plays on these empathies and this is where you know, the, the propaganda and the programming are highly effective. And you see this, you know, lots of totalitarian movements that we can look at in history uh -huh. use this kind of indoctrination tools. The, this is false positivity, the inclusivity and validation and, um, you know, uh, uh, authenticity and uh, all of these wor words feel really positive. Be kind. Exactly. Uh, yeah. you know trans rights are human rights you know all of this is is a really forced positivity that makes you feel like you're part of some sort of altruistic movement but if we examine it you know the the value set of inclusivity is only useful in very certain situations like mm -hmm. if we're talking about a third grade birthday party yeah, let's be inclusive. Let's invite the whole class. That's a that is a great time to be inclusive. But if we're talking about having boundaries, uh, if we're talking about uh, not just you know having boundaries around women's sports and spaces, um, having boundaries around uh, the language that women use to talk about our political concerns, having you know boundaries around our bodies for children and bodily authority, that word inclusion is actually an intrusion it's a yeah. wedge it's being used to violate boundaries and associate us from our humanity and as you say you know this it it does primarily it's targeting women first uh that that's that's the first target but this is just it's just the first target the target the the broad target is absolutely all of us uh -huh. you know this is why you see um you know, the, the first step in dissociating us from our humanity is to absolutely devalue and uh, mothers and make them useless. And you see this with, you know, birthing body, chest feeder, yeah. um, pregnant parent, uh, you know, all of these words that are very specifically targeted at mothers. And you don't see the same words being used at fathers. You don't see inseminating parent or ejaculating body. <laughs> like, you don't, you don't see these word prostate have you know, all of these words are very targeted at women because this is the first step in unmooring us from our humanity is for the state to take on the activity of, of creating birth and, and taking life and birth giving away from women and mothers. But, you know, if we look at this ideology, it's so um, abstracting, it's so uh, dissociative, it, there is no such thing, obviously, as an identity that could be incongruent with your body, but nor is there such a thing as having an identity that pertains to body systems or internal organs. You know, what we're not sitting around being like, well, I, I have lung identity. Oh, I don't identify with my lungs. Like what? <laughs> Yeah. I'm, a I'm a non breather. <laughs> why, why would we have an identity that that's somehow particularly attached to internal organs? Or when you know people all the time tell me, um, you know, I'm I'm reducing uh, women to our bodies to to claim to claim our full embodiment is a reduction somehow to our bodies. But but no one is sitting around saying, you know, by noticing that I'm not a plant, you're you're reducing me to being an animal, like because I have noticed that you have different mobility and nutrient intake than a plant. I you know, identify not... as a plant. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> My plant self, my pronouns are uh, photo and synthesis. 
the park. Marry me in the park. Yeah. I no, I, I think that's a really good point that you make. But you know, what it comes down to it is how it's how else do you identify what a woman is besides the biological makeup of the body? So it's yeah. not a reduction at all. It is what it is. What it is. Yeah. You know, but they they they'll also say this stuff that like you're reducing us to our genitals or why are you so obsessed with our genitals? And it's like. That's you. You're the one. It's a reversal. You're obsessed with genitals. You're the ones you hate your genitals. So it's not us who are obsessed with it. We're acknowledging what is there, what is reality. You're obsessed with it being what it is, reality, and you want it to be something else. You want to be something other than you are. You can't change those things. And frankly, yeah. most of us didn't care. You know, we I, I had no I had no qualms about gender bending. I have no qualms with trans, you know, adults. But the problem was in around 2019, I started to notice young children experimenting with gender bending. And the way that I first came across it was through uh, this little drag kid called Desmond is Amazing. And that actually was the, the first time I started really making content. I started with a solo channel uh, because I was seeing this kid pop up in my feed. He was on the New York Times. He was on my Facebook feed. He was yeah. on Twitter. And I was just like, this kid is like 12 years yeah, old. Like, this is wrong. Like, what is going on? Yeah. And so, like, and his mom had him on the YouTube channel sitting down with convicted murderer Michael, Michael Aleg, Aleg, who yes. locked up someone's body and threw it into the Hudson River. So, I mean, it just shows that the parents here are obviously like, this is like a vegan cat syndrome, right? Yeah. So, it's like the trans housing mommies are are really yeah. the the what is driving this this use of children and these impotent fathers because Desmond's father is in the picture. Yeah, he is well, at home. That, that kind of brings up another topic I did want to address too, you know, to approach it from that angle. And, you know, the, the same way they're trying to erase the importance of motherhood in women, it's like we also have a culture that has very much downplayed healthy masculinity, men. You know, we've, 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 viewed, we've created a culture that views all masculine expression as something that is inherently bad, dangerous, toxic and that's part of why things have gotten as far as they have gotten because the men are afraid to stand up they you know if they're even just a little bit assertive and they say enough of this shit the rad femme types are gonna put them down and put them in their place and say well no no, no. well so it's something to that and then there's also you know I, I address that there's a lot of there's gay men a lot of gay men speaking up and the reason a lot of gay men are speaking up and i don't necessarily fall into this category but i know people do and i have friends who do a lot of gay men always felt that they weren't men enough they weren't masculine enough they identified with women a little more they were more feminine and some of them even felt like perhaps they were supposed to be women and there, there's something to that too and now we have this ideology that is affirming that and saying well yes because because you have these characteristics that are more feminine the biggest one being that you're attracted to men which is the biggest thing you could probably have in common with most women as a man is if you're a man who's attracted to other men we're telling them that well perhaps you're just you're in the wrong body yeah there's something wrong it's with like some you, weird conversion and you could therapy. fix that and actually you were supposed to be a woman that's why you're attracted right. to men and yes it's like conversion therapy i know you know i i think that there, there's a couple of things going on and um you know that's why i appreciate this conversation and i appreciate uh channels like yours that are creating opportunities uh to have the conversation because i think that there's there's a lot of uh, programming on both sides mm -hmm. that are of men and women. These are the sides I'm talking about yeah. um, that are um, really working to uh, hinder um, exploration within a conversation. And this is on purpose. Obviously, this is the the all of the social media algorithms uh, are a setup for us to fight. It's really yeah. uh, it's a challenge to engage on these platforms uh, in a way that opens and invites conversation rather than uh, shutting it down and creating a, a narrower uh, thing. And that that's what I hope to do when I um, was responding to you, because I think, um, you know, as I said to you, uh, Brentley, when we were engaging on Twitter, I don't think, to me, I don't think the word feminism is worth defending. And I think this for, for the feminists who may be watching, uh, because it has been 
majorly co-opted you know it's a term that's used to market products and usually it's used to market um a a hyper objectified hyper sexualized version of femininity it's used by cosmo magazine and vogue and um all all of these kinds of things and it's also used by uh very the very sort of what we call liberal feminists uh in order to do things like yeah endorse this uh ideology so i don't I don't find it. I think there's so much force teaming and so much confusion oh. about that term that I don't find it useful to um, use that label. Uh, do I have a lot of radical feminist analysis in my back pocket that informs uh, that that has helped form my analysis of this entire uh, agenda? Yeah, I think it's a really useful analysis to invite into the critique because uh, it offers it offers a lot of perspective about women's material exploitation, which is is how it got created, because, you know, traditionally for the for the last 2000 years, and although it's a lot better in, in a Western country, you know, there's still many countries in Africa that do FGM. There's there's still Saudi Arabia and Afghanistan and girls not being allowed to go to school. There's still period poverty. Um, women and girls are, are 96 percent of 95 percent of sex trafficking victims. And, and radical feminism was initially created in order to address the exploitation for profit by the state of female bodies, you know, because of our reproductive capacity. And so, um, you know, this is an important, it's an important awareness to mm -hmm. have. Um, but yeah, there's, there's some, there's, there's some, uh, 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 there's some more, I don't want to say fanatical, but there's some more, um, uh, there's, there's a lot of franchising off of this original analysis, I guess a, I would this say. This is how we feel about LGBT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the same thing to us. That's how we do it. It's Take like, me out of your acronym. We, yeah. we think that it's not useful to operate within that framework. And I personally don't consider myself part of that. It is force teaming. And although there is some similarities between, say, the experience of a gay man and a lesbian and a bisexual, like all of our experiences are fundamentally different and, and yeah different. so it's just to just lump us all together that's a marketing strategy is what it is and, it and is maybe so for a time just like feminism it it had its role politically in order to obtain certain uh room in society to be able to have opportunities to go beyond your stations of yeah and and just like lgb like, yes it had yeah, just like lgb yeah. it was a, a useful way to organize to address some very needed political concerns sure yeah. uh but uh you know this is but but to get back to sort of the the dichotomy you know this is why i come from the approach of embodiment because um you know, I, I don't believe in gender. I don't think there there is no such thing as gender. There's no, um, if you reality test, <laughs> uh, there, there's no way to reality test and come up with uh, what gender is or isn't. It, it's simply a construct. Yeah, gender and like, identities are made up. Yeah, it's a pretty toxic yeah. one. But what I will talk about is that there are there are biological differences that uh -huh. inform behavior. That's why I stick to embodiment because men and women do have different qualities uh, in our bodies and in our psychologies based on the kind of bodies we have. The, these There's gonna be necessary differences with the kind of hormones that flood our systems, um, with the way that our bodies develop, and for women, the cycles that we have that are going to inform behavior. So there are things uh, in because of our bodies that inform uh, how we behave. And again, there's a broad range, you know, in terms of behavior slash personality, slash psychology, there's no way to talk about um, a woman psychology or a man psychology because there, there is such a, a broad range. However, um, there are within those ranges observable uh, traits that- statistical common things that you will find up. Yeah. Peterson talks about this often, and it's it's usually a 60-40 difference when it comes to things in, say, the big five personality scale yeah. between the common feminine temperament and the common 
masculine temperament but it doesn't mean all men are going to fall into the common masculine temperament they're always outliers and it's the same it's the same with women so it's and like you said a lot of it does have to do with the body like one of the sexes literally develops a human being inside of itself so that is going to determine a lot of things about how that particular sex statistically speaking is probably going to behave in certain interests it's going to have uh, i know peterson talks about the the main difference that you find statistically speaking between men and women is that women tend to be more interested in people and men tend to be more interested in things. Obviously, there are exceptions. You know, you're going to have men who prefer to be in nursing and teaching and those sorts of things. And you will have women who prefer to be in the sciences and work with cars or whatever. But that's not the common reality. The common reality is most women are going to prefer to be in, in certain jobs and careers and positions where they're working with people because they have that more nurturing temperament because they give birth and they have to take care of a young being when that young being comes out of them a lot of that work is done in those early years by by the woman and then men they they tend to be into gadgets and things they can touch and just you know take apart and put back together and, and that sort of thing and that's a pretty major difference then there's the difference in strength you know, we don't yeah. want to acknowledge that, but it's why you can't just have a man who identifies as a woman in women's sports, especially uh, fighting sports, you know, and this was one of the things that brought uh, Joe Rogan's attention onto this issue was when an MMA fighter who was identifying as a woman broke a, broke the skull of, of, a, of a woman fighter, a female fighter. So there is a disparity of force. And I think at that point, too, Fallon Fox was not even out yeah. as transgender. Yeah. So, but so they're, it's just they're, fighting women in a women's league without yeah. even telling the opponent yeah. that she's actually a man. Obviously, there are exceptions. There are some women out there who are larger and have larger frames and are stronger and go to the gym and could probably beat up quite a few men. Yes, but, exceptions are yes. exceptional. And there are men who are some of them who are small in stature and aren't very big. But statistically speaking, yes, men have wider shoulders more bone density more muscle mass all those well, i know i know you said you were you said you were coming from the gym yes. um my, my yeah. sister is a, a crossfit coach and it's awesome. it's about you know uh they they like to say talk about their their competition being the fittest man and the fittest woman on earth and you know you're you're gonna see if you watch these competitions their games you, you see you know with these incredibly fit women who lift and you know because it's it's also it's, it's the whole thing you know lifting and endurance and gymnastics and all these things um and while <laughs> you know there there are certain things that women excel at some sometimes women are exceptional at these gymnastic movements because of the way our ligaments and bodies function mm -hmm. um ultimately <laughs> you know they it, it has to be segregated by sex because you know men you know if women can can deadlift you know 300 pounds men can deadlift 600 you know more it, it, more, more yeah more yeah thank you more than I, I, yeah. <laughs> but um you know bodies bodies are really different and when you when you were going back to where you were talking about um you know healthy healthy masculinity you know we 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 need men who are healthy and who uh, can do this, and especially in our, because we are sexual, a sexually dimorphic species, um, being pregnant and giving birth is a vulnerable activity. You are vulnerable during that time. And so, you know, ultimately in, in animals, and we are animals, <laughs> um, mammals, um, you know, the male is needed to guard and protect during this time because it is a vulnerable time for the you female need, who is going you need through that. The good men to protect from the bad ones. It's very, yeah. it's, an, it's an important thing, and it's it is the reality because a bad man in a woman's space is going to be able to take advantage of most of those women. Yeah. Will there be an outlier who could probably put a fight on? Absolutely, but statistically speaking, the men's going to have the disparity of force. So you, sometimes, you know, you're going to need you're going to need men to stand up. And I think that's what we're seeing in this whole gender ideology movement is we really do need more men to step up and to say, you know what, enough of this shit. I'm going to be assertive and I'm going to stand here and I'm going to go to these protests, too, where these women are marching and they're saying, uh, no, I'm an adult human female. Excuse me. And the men need to stand in between them and the crazy radical trans activists and say you need to back the fuck up right now okay because this woman here is speaking and i'm speaking too 
we need more of that. And this is also yeah. something that we've seen on the street when we've gone yes. out. We just went out to a uh, drag queen story hour protest down here in, in Manhattan. And the one thing that really stuck out was the aggression towards the female activists mm -hmm. on our side, way yes. higher than what they would ever attempt towards us, the men. Because they know men are more likely to physically fight back. Fight back. Yes. Yeah, but they they will they'll they'll throw things at women. Yep. They'll knock their signs out. Yeah. You know, they don't even like to get close to me. They stand you know far away and yes. they take pictures and videos because they yep. think that that's going to intimidate me. Honey, I'm on the internet broadcasting myself like three times a week. Like. Yeah. Sweet. Nice. <laughs> yeah. All you're doing is like pumping my brain. We have this footage out there from that event, but we were going back and forth with this. He was a man, although he has face covered, and he said he was queer, and we were questioning him on what the hell that even means. <sighs> um, we had this back and forth, and you know, there's kind of a bit of a shouting match because people are really loud, so you can't hear each other, and we're kind of yelling back and forth at each other. And it was me, Brent, our friend Mikey, our friend Zitro, all gay men too. <laughs> on the side That's against funny. the drag story hour, but they, they don't want to acknowledge that they hate it. And as soon as a woman stepped in to say the same things toward this guy and hold her sign out the way we were, um, he got more bullet drink, got closer to her, hit her sign, threw something at her. It's like interesting, right? As soon as the woman steps in and says this, now you feel all of a sudden you're bold enough where you'll you'll do something physical towards the woman because you know that woman's not gonna be able to fight back as well as all the men around you. Yeah. And it, of course it's, the men stepped in and we were like, you need to back the hell up and then the cops went and they scored it's the guy away. Really crazy on, on my channel. Um so I have organized, I think about maybe ten myself, but on my channel I've covered uh over forty events that have been done in the United States. And of course they're they're being done in all kinds of places all you know, all over the UK does a ton, Scotland uh, does a ton, uh, France and, and Spain have, have done all kinds of, uh, of these uh, protesting rallies, free speech events. But it's very interesting because, um, you know, my, my Let Julie Swim event uh, that I did in Port Townsend, which was to protect Julie Jamon, who is an 80 year old woman who who protected girls. She stood up to um, a, a man who was helping little girls in a state of undress in the YMCA locker room. And she told him to get out. Um, and of course, she's the one who was called the bigot. But ultimately, we, we arranged this press conference. We were about 35 women. I There was one woman who was younger than me, maybe two women who were younger than me. But ultimately, you know, we were all, all of the women were like middle age and older, many of whom were, were 70. And we had about 400 Antifa and TRA surrounding us, attacking us, um, pulling off our, literally pulling off clothes, crawling, crawling between our legs. It was so bizarre behavior um, and pushing women to the ground. They Same. told the story when they told the story about it, when the paper wrote about it, uh, they said, you know, the Port Townsend showed those bullies. I was like, who, who was the bullies? Um, and this is often what happens, you know, Kay Yang and I did an event with, uh, I don't know if you know, uh, Kelly J. Keene was here in the U.S. Um, she did 11 events across the U.S. Um, women were harmed in Tacoma. Women were harmed in Portland. Um, women were harmed in New York City. And in the New York City event, um, if you look at the footage, um, we, I have some great footage on my channel. Tim cast got some great footage, uh, CBS news covered it. They, they, even though they covered it from the opposite side, still the footage tells the story. Um, but you see these activists are, are literally pushing at this barricade that the police set up. And if, if those police hadn't have been there, we would have been entirely Sorry. harmed. And as you said, they, they feel completely empowered to go against women. And as you said, they are completely. Uh, homophobic. There were two um, uh, um, models. One is a coach model. One is um, one. One's a man who's a coach model. One is a woman who she's been in um, like a Madonna video and a Miley Cyrus video. I forget who she works for. Um, you know who who are a, a, a trans man and a 
trans woman, uh, but you know, a man and a woman. Uh, but anyway, they they took their shirts off. They were the the the, man, the male the man was like had his fists out and was like these fists don't discriminate. I, I'm gonna beat you up. I was oh, like, oh, that, that yes, that yeah. footage. We we wanted like, to go to that and we missed we missed that event completely. Yeah, that, it was person, insane. That, that man sent uh, verbal threats to Andy No, like sent yeah. messages like watch your back, all the, the nasty stuff to Andy No, like yeah. Yeah, and we we had um, Jim Forsett, who is a Stonewall veteran, who was at the event, and and that coach model guy was calling him the F word. Uh, he was calling women dykes. He was calling. He he yeah. repeatedly said that word to Jim. I mean, it was so obviously just homophobic so homophobic um and so violent he spit on us he hit at us i mean it was this guy was crazy and yeah he he went after andy no after that because andy no told our story yep. um you know and you see this is often what happens when women organize our events and i i think that just to uh i think women are uh, just are can get frustrated. Uh, not no, I don't think anyone wants to stop. You know, Billboard Chris from doing what he's doing. Of course, he should do with his work that he's doing, and uh, Matt Matt Wall should do his work. But I think we we do hear a lot. Where, where are the women? Where are the feminists? Uh, and I think it's it's frustrating because um, our events don't get covered. We don't get as much publicity, and mm -hmm. we're. He highlights that, you know, and when people criticize him and say, hey, you know, are you just trying to be in the face of the movement? What he finds so ironic about the whole thing, and he's saying, well, there's actually, a, there's a lot of women out there doing a lot to fight this issue. And instead, you're over here focusing on me and how effective I'm being. But he's like, you know, what about Moms for Liberty? What about all these other groups that are doing this that I've been working with and we're cooperating? And so I think the Rad Femmes who come after him, I, I just think they're, they're not they're not doing themselves any favors they're not doing anyone any favors they're just they're creating division within a movement that should be a human movement humans should be getting together and saying we're going to stand up for very basic biological reality for humanity because men are being erased and women are being erased this is a human issue it, it shouldn't be something that you know feminists take and they say this is our issue simply yeah. because what there's an uptake of of women identifying as men Right, it is actually hurt. It's, it is harming women more when you have men and women spaces. That does harm women more than it harms men. But the reality of the situation is, you erase biology, you erase both. Yeah, so this yeah. is our issue too. Um, yeah, and I think that's important. why we need, you know, we need people who can point out how these algorithms function, yes. um, because it it only serves their agenda to create infighting, mm -hmm. you know? So those of us who have the capacity uh, to create a little space and open up the conversations and, um, you know, it's not always possible. No one is perfect, but, you know, as much as possible when I have people coming to me, um, you know, with that kind of, of anger, you know, I'll try to create openings in the conversation because I, I am empathetic to um you know their wounds you know that they're they're only coming from that perspective because mm -hmm. of either perceived flights or uh, is perceived slights or silencing um you know there i try to look at those reasons and then you know open up the conversation because you know as you say it, it is ultimately going to take all of us you know there we and and the fact of the matter is you know um at the end of the day we're we're a, a sexually dimorphic species you know um uh, you know and this this is you know not to uh dishonor those who are gay or lesbian with the you guys are amazing, um, but you know we are a, a a species that needs one another to procreate. Okay. Uh, <laughs>
kind of important. We we need we need one another at the end of the day. You know, we 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 um we we need to uh, build build the bridges and and uh, and be be in um be in alliance. You know, build build those alliances, and I, I think they're so important. You know, this is you know as as I will repeat, it's our tether. You know, this is this is our 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 humanity, our biology. This is our tether to to this physical material plane that we find ourselves in and you know if if you don't mind i i would love to talk to the point of how you know this work that i do embodiment work this is these these are the primary building blocks of safeguarding you know understanding your embodiment being present to your sense perceptions and awarenesses you know what i find so terrifying is that we are telling kids that they can no longer trust their own eyes and ears mm -hmm. you know and, and by their feelings whatever you feel that's that's what you are and i'm sorry but that's not a healthy way to no work. and 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 to separate feelings like what are the feeling emotion versus feeling physical sensation yep. because the only the only feelings that pertain to being a man or a woman are physical physical sensations um whatever emotions we have any human can have any emotion, yeah. but also kids are being told by their teachers, you know, you don't know who's a boy or a girl. You can't trust, you know, teacher so and so. Like, the, like the kids, we see these these videos from libs of TikToks, you know, like the teachers, like um, the kid says, "You're a girl," and the teacher says, "No, I'm a boy," or "No, I'm a they," um, or the t the kid says, "You're a boy," and the teacher says, "No, I'm I'm a girl," and this is telling kids Amazing. that they cannot trust. The authority of their own bodies that their bodies are not an authority on the world around them and this is a primary uh, uh awareness a primary instinct sex recognition is is up there with fight and flight and food recognition as a primary instinct for all animals and to dissociate kids from their ability to name and claim the authority of their own bodies that is a massive safeguarding yeah. failure. That that is to tell and, that. And then, then when they start actually having the sensations and feelings that are related to their body, they they're gonna start to hate those things because they're gonna want to be the other one. And if it's they also to, it's very disarming like, too yeah. because a lot of our uh, a lot of our instincts are nonverbal mm -hmm. and they are you know like you said it's wired into our sense of fight or flight we may have an instinctual feeling about an individual we may you know well that that person feels creepy or this person feels unsafe yeah and your your subconscious your unconscious is picking up on signals that your conscious mind it can't process because you don't have the reference but those feelings are important to trust and to believe. Uh, and especially for women, you know, if they have a, a sense around a man that's unsafe, mm -hmm. you want to believe those feelings and you want to act accordingly. Especially now, for children, yeah. man. Well, that's the thing is they're, they're short-circuiting that circuit for children Very they're trying young. to get in yep. there early and this is why i mean a lot of it a lot of it comes back to grooming and it, because i feel like it's disabling the natural you know when we i grew up in the 80s and we had stranger danger yep. and i you know was told again and again and again anybody's trying to get in your pants anybody touches you in a way anybody makes you feel uncomfortable you go tell mom and dad you tell a teacher you yeah. tell a police officer don't accept candy from strangers now it's the other way around it's like take the candy like yeah. hang out get with the weirdo the like yeah, if you have fine. if like, you have bad feelings about a person well maybe that's because there's something wrong with you yeah it's like yeah. they're just different well, and we're telling these kids we literally posted on their bathroom walls to these kids if you see someone in here um, that you don't think should be in here um, trust them look the other way help them feel safe so it's literally telling them to discount their yeah. own instincts and Gavin de Becker talks about this in his book the gift of fear he, he is an yeah, amazing uh, safeguarding expert he says that humans are the only animal uh, that will try to rationalize and talk themselves out out of their own instincts. And he tells a story about a woman who was waiting to get on an elevator. Um, there was a man who was just, you know, in a business suit, he was dressed nice. She had a bad feeling about him and thought for a minute, I don't, I don't wanna get on the elevator. But then she thought, well, I don't wanna be rude. I mean, he's dressed very nice. She, she went through this whole rationalization process 
um, to talk herself out of her instinct and unfortunately did end up getting attacked. Um, and and we, if we have an instinct, you know, this this um, middle part of our brain, this is, um, th that includes our parietal lobe, this is the pr uh, pattern recognition part of our brain. That instinctual part of our brain, which also includes the um, uh, basal ganglia, uh, this, this is, these instincts are almost instantaneous. Our sense perceptions, our pattern recognition, our, our, um, uh, our, our, our sense awarenesses are, are instantaneous. Whereas anything that our prefrontal cortex has to analyze um it's a it's a lot more linear plotting analytical process so um by comparison it's a much slower process it mm -hmm. takes a lot longer so if we're telling women you know um you know i should not have to if i go into a bathroom and a, and a man walks in i should be able to be responsive to those instincts like he shouldn't be in here respond but now this ideology is putting a thought program because yep. a trans woman that's an abstract thought programming so now i'm in a mental analysis of what i don't why is this man in here what are his style choices now i'm trying to look at him and come should up i say something should i not is someone going to to be upset if i say something when so i'm immediately dissociated from my instincts and i i want to touch on grooming because i think this is so urgent for kids and i want to be clear about what what grooming is and i don't know if you guys have read uh stephen hassan's work on the bite model uh i'm sorry that's that's cults sorry that's that's a different topic um but let's just i'll stay on grooming um but but the way that grooming functions <laughs> Uh, is um, uh, uh, often charm, um, mm -hmm. but to create instances of privacy and access and to create instances of normalization and desensitate desensitization of boundary violations. Um, and when when we're talking about grooming, I think a lot of people think it is always going to be one-on-one -on -one targeted grooming, but the fact of the matter is institutions can groom, um, mm -hmm. cults can groom, ideologies can groom. So even though they, I, I call this trans thing a cult, it has a lot of the cult markers that I was almost going to go there for a second, but, um, um, but even if there is not a centralized leadership, um, the, it, it functions with the uh, talking heads and celebrity uh, and the way that it's mass marketed. Uh, it functions as a, a, a grooming, a mass grooming through the programming. And what we see in like the, the drag story hour or the the um you know the the friendly uh transsexual who wants to go into the women's bathroom is this is normalizing and desensitizing boundary violations so you're no longer allowed to have a boundary around sex and and it, it's it's trying to groom you away from your instincts and this is you know it's a problem for all of us, but it is a huge problem for the kids who are being raised into yeah. this. Yeah, and we saw not too long ago, there was that big controversy in Loudoun County, Virginia, where a boy who was identifying as a whatever uh, had access Gender to- Gender fluid was his I identity claim. Yeah, and his mom's a real wackadoo too, if you see the pictures of her. But she, uh, he, he went into, you know, he sexually assaulted a young girl and then because of his, his status, they covered it up, transferred him. And instead of, you know, putting him into a, you know, charging him with crimes and, and putting him into treatment, they, they'll put him into another school and he did it again. <laughs> it's like, what's going on? Oh my gosh. Sorry, it's loud here. New York. <laughs> Just pause. Yeah, oh, we're, we're, we're absolutely enabling uh, predators. And this is why I like to be really clear as well that when I'm talking about sex-based safeguarding, um, I'm, I'm only talking about sex. You know, people, uh, you know, of course they like to uh, accuse me of being phobic and um, I mean, I don't really care. But also when I'm not trying to segregate based on identity, I'm not telling, I'm not saying no, 
specifically to quote unquote trans women. I'm saying no to all men. <laughs> I'm I'm saying that the category of sex uh, deserves protection and its own safeguarding. And the fact of the matter is, boys need privacy too. Um, and I don't know if you heard the story that happened. Maybe this was four or five months ago uh, in Michigan, where a bunch of boys said no, they didn't want uh, this this girl who was a classmate who was um, you know identifying as a boy. They didn't want her to use their bathroom and locker room. These boys got suspended under a Title IX violation. Crazy. So Title IX, which was created to protect the category of sex, these boys are now, uh, uh, I don't I don't think they ended up getting, uh, I don't think it ended up uh, prosecuting through or the case may still be um, evolving, but, but they got suspended under that uh, condition under Title IX, they were accused um, of being the harassers, although they were the ones trying to claim boundaries for their bodies. You know, boys want privacy too. I mean, girls need it for for safety reasons, like the the Loudoun County incident, but. Boys also want privacy. They don't. They don't want to be in a locker room with with girls and in states of undress. And we should have that integrity. We should. We should be able to have. Um, you know, we we shouldn't have to uh, create. We shouldn't have to share our traumas to say why we need boundaries. You know, we we should just have privacy because we have different bodies, and that's okay. Yeah. yeah, at the end of the day, I feel, you know, gender dysphoria is a mental problem. It's a mental mm -hmm. illness. It's a it's a mind condition. Yeah. And the way that we've taken that and turned it into this identity of transgendered people, and now they extend that to trans kids, you know, it's all a lie and it's all BS. These are people with a mental problem. We don't call schizophrenics you know, uh, people of paranoia. And we don't work all of society to, you know, custom uh, indulge their particular mental problem. You well, know, they have... Okay. Even the DSM is part of the engineering because I, I have a video and I have a writing that I, I'm an essay that I'm working on right now debunking the term gender dysphoria because gen the word the 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 definition of gender dysphoria in the dsm is to have a quote gender identity that is quote incongruent with your body well i reject yes. that there's such yes. a thing as a gender identity yes. so i reject this diagnosis as a diagnosis um you know people have all kinds of symptoms they have uh, autism spectrum disorders they have sexual abuse issues uh frankly some have uh, uh, OCD issues that uh, get them hyper focused on on bodies. They have a, a hyper focus on their secondary there's, sexual characteristics. Yeah, there, there's all I'm kinds of uncomfortable those characteristics, and that is that's a mental disorder. Like we had yeah. Sarah Higdon on our show twice. Sarah Higdon is a trans person, identifies as transsexual. Actually, uses that term even though knows that can't really change your sex. That's not something you can do. But the language is so convoluted. It is convoluted, but has admitted I have a mental disorder, even got temporarily suspended from Twitter for saying that, that what I have is a mental disorder. And part of that disorder, it was the discomfort at the secondary sexual characteristics. That, yeah, that's not yeah. and I, I, dis I, I disagree with him a little because, you know, he says that this is something that you're gonna have for life. And I, I don't, I can't agree with that. You know, I don't agree that if you're an anorexic, it's something that you're gonna have for life. I don't agree that these things, um, whether or not he is still experiencing it, I don't think it's a blanket mm -hmm. statement that I can agree to. Um, and further, <laughs> I do call him out for using women's spaces, you know, yeah. to me, this is inappropriate. He, I if agree. he is an ally, he needs to to stand up and be an example and be an example of a man who dresses and behaves differently and uses men's spaces. Yep. No, we, we agree. And Brent's had some Twitter back and forth with Sarah. We before. disagree on things. Yeah, it's sure. Fine. We had Buck Angel on the show as well. And, and Buck also says it's a mental disorder, you know, is of the same position i don't know if buck is using male spaces but i think buck should also it would make sense to take one for the team and stand up for reality and say well i'm gonna just go back to using women's spaces now it's hard i though. guess buck really passes buck does really pass <laughs> um and i think that's kind of the the conversation here is that is that every time buck uses female spaces 
Buck is going to have a lot of explaining to do. You know, I think I think so, women, I, I think men deserve privacy, as I've said. Um, yeah. And for women, it is a safety issue. And uh, I don't think we should use uh, women who, you know, have have that that amount of masculine features as as a gotcha to like disprove. Yeah, no, Buck is like definitely. Women. Definitely the exceptional. Like, but the other thing is there's so many public spaces that are unisex. That's or, probably what we need a little more of is, yeah. is businesses to at least have a unisex sort of space where anyone could just use that. And you're opting to use that. And whatever you encounter in there, you have the understanding that you can encounter a male. Or if it's just like female. a single. single or, there's a lot like of single stall yeah. spaces. And I think, you know, the way you know, I, I, you know, if you are in most cities these days, you are going to find public places with single stalls. I just don't think there's, there's no real excuse to uh, violate women and girls boundaries when it comes to single sex spaces. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. The language is definitely very strange. It's like all of the terminology that we use around this topic is this, it's so inverted and so backwards. Like, and the, the, this one of the things I was thinking about with the, you know, it, it would say there is, you know, there's a mental problem called dysphoria. You know, we, you would, you would call the person who experiences that a dysphoric just the same way you would call somebody who has schizophrenia a schizophrenic or somebody who's who has anorexia we call them an anorexic we don't build this whole convoluted ideology around the issue in order to affirm you know the problem we we try to treat the problem and we recognize that it is a problem and generally we recognize that it has you know a root in trauma or you know something to do with with childhood and and bad parenting all the trans people and all the detrans people we've spoken to on the show have a background with trauma trauma and, and this is this used to be recognized in the mental health profession you know 15 years ago in, in you know if you were um in the mental health field if you were going Going by the APA and, and, and the DSM-5 uh, and, and a child came to you telling you they were having hatred or dissociative feelings toward their genitals, the number one thing you are going to ask about is sexual trauma. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I do not understand how these conversations are taking place without addressing that. That, that is literally the, the number one reason uh, that children come, uh, that, that they start having these dissociative or hateful feelings towards their own bodies. And to yep. not address that is crazy. And the, the other thing about you know my, my problem with the diagnosis of, of gender dysphoria is because there's no blanket reason like we have so many men who are claiming this term who are you know autogynephilic who are who are clearly having a paraphilia yeah, um is. and this is not the same you know to to what is happening for them is not the same as something that is happening to a young girl or a young boy who is experiencing this so to me this this yeah. diagnosis there's is definitely also there's a difference between saying really having that discomfort with your secondary sex characteristics and being sexually aroused by trying to appear as, as the other sex. Yeah. And, and we're kind of finding that on both sides. It's not just men, although I think most of that autogynephilia is is the the trans women or the men. I mean, and if you look at like the, the women quote too. unquote academic. There, I'm sorry, but there are these women who want to be gay men yeah yeah this is something that we encounter a lot on twitter they call people like us bigots because we say we won't sleep with them and yeah. they have these porn fetishes they yeah. want to be fucked like men fuck men and they that's that's how they want to be desired and received they want to be passed around and all this stuff and orgies and I'm just like who hurt fetish. you it's, and, who hurt and you? there's trauma related in that too i think having those deep sexual fetishes there's trauma that's rooted in, in that just as well as as the uh, discomfort with that was one that was like something i noticed here in the gay yeah. scene in manhattan in my 20s a lot of, is that a lot of the yeah. a lot of dudes in the kink community 
they have these backgrounds yeah. in, in trauma or they had a terrible experience with one of their parents or they were touched by somebody in youth. And I'm just like, it seems like fetishes and kinky behavior are emotional scar tissue. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I was going to say that these so-called academics who are writing about this, you know, they are the ones who are creating the current field around it. Uh, men like Andrea Long Chu, men like Grace Laverly, uh, if you read their books, they talk about this very explicitly. They're not shy about it. They talk about uh, sissy hypno porn and trans maxing and how porn influence. Wait, what, what is that? Trans maxing. <laughs> what, what's what's? Uh, what? So trans maxing. This this is um, an trans. incel movement. Uh, so if you are an incel and you cannot uh, gain, uh, uh, you can't get a sexual partner who is a woman, uh, you can do uh, trans maxing, be led down the path of trans maxing. So basically you, you become uh, the woman that you wish that you could sleep with and you um, make yourself available to sexual partners who are men. Uh, and now you're, you're no longer an incel. You, you have a, you have a sexual uh, life. Okay. It's, it's pretty sick. It's, so what it's was sissy, the other one? Sissy something? And sissy hypnoporn. And Genevieve Gluck uh, has extensive research about this. Uh, and, and again, Andrea Longchu writes about it. Grace Laverly writes about it. They, again, these are academics at Berkeley who are professors talking about this in their field. Um, but sissy hypnoporn is a, a genre of porn that literally uses um, uh, 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 like ASMDR and hypnotic techniques. Wow. Uh, and the notion is that you are, um, once you start watching it, it walks you down a path of feminization uh, mm -hmm. so that you are, um, the more you watch it, the more you want to take on this, um, you know, this, this this um, uh, 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 fetishized womanhood. So one, it's a terrible propaganda against women because it it makes women, um, you know, uh, a, a whole. Um, it, it makes women just a f hole. They they talk right. about that like like to you know Andrea Longchu says in his book to be female is to be effed. Um, and that and that an an open anus is like the ultimate vagina, uh, and that. You know, and that to be to be female is to be empty, is to be submissive, to be dominated. You know, and and it's crazy that that this is what the literal academics are saying, and and then yet you you have these young activists who do not point out the absolute rampant uh, uh, sexist hyper objectification in this ideology. Crazy. You know, and again, this this is what the academics are saying. This this is what they are writing about themselves i'm just quoting what they say in their books right. um you know and and uh it's uh, there's a i don't know if you follow uh skirt goes spinny uh, but she, she, she has a great YouTube account, but she has a wonderful, uh, pretty short, uh, like very visually well done video called um, In Their Own Words. And it's just uh, these men telling you what they what it means to be a woman in their own words. And th these are the words they use Barbie and bimbo and empty and whole and submissive and dominated and just um, like the like, again, the very the very very like edge of, of sexist things that you could say about a woman, this is what they're saying it means for themselves to be a woman. So it's it's just like and and you try to get like like you said, these like these these do good um you know be kind moms, like you you try to raise their awareness level like hey lady this this is what's being taught to your kids. This is this is the underlying ideology that you're pushing for. Um and and they they will just tune you out you mm -hmm. know and I'll, I'll try to you know I'll, I'll try to have conversations all the time where i'm like i'm only reporting what an academic said in his own words i'm reporting this to you to get your feedback on it um and and they'll try to you know tune you out because they have you know they have sweet little kai shevers in their brain or um yeah. you know some some little you know toe-headed blue-eyed long eyelashed uh little boy who they have in their mind about who they're trying to protect, not like the dirty, gross man who is on porn all day. Yep. 
Yeah, yeah it's very strange. Very oh, strange. Boy, uh, on that note, sissy hypno porn. Sissy hypno porn. I think we should probably wrap it up there. <laughs> I need to eat something too, and we're going to shoot another episode That's fine. after this. Amy, let everybody yeah. know where they can find you. Awesome. Uh, I am known heretic on most of my platforms, which is Twitter, uh, YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok. Uh, you can find my website, uh, littleredreverberations.com. My substack is thenownheretic.com. And uh, yeah, and you can follow my activism. I have uh, an event coming up in Texas with Partners for Ethical Care on April 20th, where I'll be speaking. Yeah. Uh, there's a bunch of other wonderful experts on that panel, Miriam Grossman, uh, Kay Yang, Alex Aaron, uh, Jennifer Lal. I will also be in Tennessee on April the 27th with Riley Gaines. So we're going to do a great talk, um, a panel discussion on women's wow, spaces cool. and women's sports. So what that happened is... to her, man? Oh my God, that footage was crazy. Anyone who has not seen that footage yet, that happened in God California, bless her for getting out there it. and speaking up because they had her... this is what we need. We need the women, at, we need the yeah. people who are being most directly affected to get out there and yeah. and to do the, the work, you know, and she puts herself, she put her body on the yeah. line, she put her safety and also line. men good men stand up for these women freaking protect them get the hell out there you know get on the front lines do something like who cares if they call you toxic and masculine and all that shit get out there and tell these people to fuck the hell off but they had her barricaded in a room for three hours i could not believe that it was pure insanity and what the hell did the cops do? nothing impotent shameful so shameful i can't with that um Chloe Cole speaking at one of your events too. I and then in yeah. June, um, I will be in Pleasant Hill, California with yeah, Chloe Cole and Benjamin Boyce. And that is with um, the Center for Bioethics and Culture uh, by Jennifer cool. Lal. Um, yeah, and I wanna just say, we have some great sponsors for our event in um, Tennessee, which is uh, Gays Against Groomer and Icons, which is the women's sporting organization. Awesome. Uh, Moms for Liberty is helping sponsor that event as well. Um, uh, yeah, and, and international uh, uh, IWF International Women's Forum is also a sponsor. So thank you to all of them. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, we're affiliated with a lot of the Gays Against Groomers people. And yeah, big fans of the gag had a crew. A couple of, of their affiliates on as well. And we're trying to get Tiffany from Moms for Liberty on at some point. Right. Um, we know she's, just, Bill, she's busy. She's yeah, working hard. Billboard like, Chris is, you know, works. With I her. highly suggest uh, my co-speaker, uh, Kay Yang. She is an LGBTQ whistleblower. She was a former okay. activist turned whistleblower. She's she's great on this. Awesome. We Sweet. appreciate that. I'll have to look out. Have to Amy, look thank you so much for talking to us. And thank you so much for the work that you're doing and being brave and speaking out and standing up for reality. Like, this is the hill to die on, people. Yep. This is the hill to die on. Join the fight. Yep. And don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, share the show with your friends. Give us your money. We love you. Stay safe. Stay sane. And we'll be back again soon. Bye-bye.